Hey folks, today I thought we'd discuss soil. And, and we're going to start off with soil one because I can conceive of the possibility of uh, creating several more soil lectures uh, or soil discussions because this is probably going to be a bit overwhelming. Uh, so let's get started. So I guess I first should state that soil, water, sun, and air are all absolutely vital components for life on Earth. So soil is extremely important. important. So uh, soil isn't dirt, but today we're actually going to be discussing the components that actually make up soil and dirt. So what is soil? Well, soil is a mixture of the minerals from parent material, the rock that's there, the organic matter, gases, liquids, and countless organisms, including microorganisms that we can't see without a microscope, and those that we can see, uh, insects, uh, earthworms, all of those things are all necessary to support life on Earth as we know it. So let's start off with soil size classifications. So in this image we can see this whole box is probably about one millimeter in length, and you can see that a grain of sand, which is this big circle here, is quite large relative to a grain of silt. It almost looks like a, a, a crater on the earthscape. And the tiny dot of clay is so small it looks, it's completely dwarfed even by the gr granule of silt. So it's all about the soil sizes that allow us to have life in soil and therefore plants to provide us with food. So soil is, is broken down by its particle size. So sand is between 2 millimeters in size and 0.05 millimeters. Silt is, is between 0.05 millimeters and 0.002 millimeters in size. And then our clay, which is the tiniest of all, is less than 0.002 millimeters. Excuse me. So soil life really is dependent on the spaces. And the spaces, uh, or the pores in the soil, is determined by the relative constituents, the, the combination of the sand, silt, and clay. So, so, for example, solid rock makes a fantastic foundation. You can build a good, if you have a good rock footer, you can build good foundation walls and support a building that can last centuries. However, uh, solid rock does not support life. So it's a porosity of soil that actually supports life. So let's discuss that porosity. It's a measure of the total pore space in a soil sample. It depends on the minerals that make up the soil, and it's a measure of the volume or percentage of the soil sample that we're examining. The space in the soil that can be filled by water and or air. It's the space of the soil that determines the soil's function. Uh, the dimensions of this poor space is what determines whether the soil can actually support life or not. So poor size determines water flow. So for example, uh, large particles like sand that create large pores and therefore sand percolates or drains water rapidly. So if you had a deep sand uh, uh, soil surface and subsurface, what's going to happen is the precipitation from a rain event is just going to percolate right down through the sand and get right to the water table, potentially, unless it reaches some other barrier between the water table and the sand. Whereas the pore size determines the soil's ability to hold and release water and nutrients making them bioavailable to the microorganisms and the plants that are there, or the plant roots. So weathering. Uh, weathering is the parent material, is the geologic uh, material that formed, containing the minerals that make up the rock. So the parent material is the rock, and it's really a geologic process. If the components are, are, the rock is made up of various mineral components. The weathering process results in smaller and smaller fragments and then ultimately into the uh, soil particles, starting off with sand being the lar largest, going down to silt and then down to clay, ultimately. So weathering is caused by physical processes like wind, uh, water, the waves uh, uh, 
beating against the shore, the rivers running along the, the, the surface as well. Uh, all of these physical pr processes, including what man does. Then we have the biological and chemical processes that go on. Uh, an example of biological is the lichen on rocks. It's breaking down and, and, and making the minerals vile, um, and, and uh, small particles available to, to build soil. Uh, weathering can break down rock particles or dissolve and then reform the particles as well. So soil particles vary in size, shape, and chemical composition. So each soil sample can be quite different. Even on your piece of property, uh, the soil com constituents, this, these, these, uh, the, the mother uh, or the parent material being broken down into its various sizes is going to have different characteristics on different uh, so sections of your property. The mineral portion is therefore also quite variable. Uh, so the weathering is a function of climate, organisms, the relief, parent material, and time. Dry land climates, there's very low precipitation. They're, they're often flat areas. There's low temperatures, and therefore the weathering rate is very low. The particle size is usually large since the weathering rate is, is slow. Uh, then the particles really don't get broken down into the silt and clay sizes. So it's very porous. Uh, so large par particles make large pores and there we have rapid drainage which doesn't hold and release, make available to the plant and the microorganisms the water and nutrients that are necessary. So dry lands are tough as a result of this, this weathering process. Temperate climates, I'm blessed to live in a cold temperate climate, and we have the benefit of moderate precipitation and moderate temperatures. This results in moderate weather, uh, weathering rates. We have a balance between the sand, the silt, and the clay, typically all across, across temperate climate zones. So the texture is often referred to as a loam. Uh, moderate pore size drains adequately, yet holds enough water and nutrients to make them bioavailable to the microorganisms and the roots of the plants that are in the soil. So the medium-sized particles and pores hold the water that the plants can easily access. So it's the combination of having some sand particles with many silt and, f and few clay particles. So we have this moderate uh, pore size. The moderate amount of uh, impure clays, uh, small particles and pores, uh, they have a slight charge to them and therefore they can hold and release the nutrients uh, uh, to the microorganisms and the plants. So that, that impure clays that are in uh, temperate climates are actually really excellent at ho helping to hold the, the micronutrients and make them more available to the microorganisms and the plant roots. What about in a tropical climate? Well, we have high precipitation rates and high temperature, which actually yields very high weathering rates. So we get smaller and smaller particles. So we get predominantly clay-sized particles. In the the fine particles create very fine pores, which doesn't drain very well under the forces of gravity. It, it, it holds the water instead and doesn't allow adequate air or, um, or drainage uh, of, of that soil. And therefore, th as a result of these, this, uh, this rapid weathering, the clays lose their impure state and no longer have a charge or have a very limited charge and therefore they have an inability to release those nutrients to the microorganisms and the plant roots. So although I always thought that uh, the uh, tropical climate was the most ideal place to live, I'm actually blessed that we live in a temperate climate. What about organic matter and climate? Well, in the dry land climates, organic matter accumulates very slowly because there's very limited water supply. It's an arid, uh, very, very dry environment, so as things die, they don't decompose very rapidly. 
Whereas in temperate climate, we have uh, you know, moderate precipitation and temperatures, and therefore organic matter uh, decomposes at a moderate rate. Whereas in a tropical climate, organic, organic matter doesn't accumulate because of the high precipitation and high temperature causes rapid decomposition. Things decompose so rapidly that it's taken right up by the, by the plants and most of the organic material, the nutrients, are actually in the plant material itself above the soil. So what about the landscape soil, the bedrock and water position? It'd be ideal if I had a picture of this, but I really don't have a good picture, but if you were to take a, a, uh, a slice through the, the side of a landscape and look at where the relative bedrock is, where the water table is in, in the area, and where the uh, soil is. So the soil, the top soil is on the surface going all the way down from the top of the hill, working its way down, down either a gentle slope or a steep slope, and then going down to the, to the uh, valley at the bottom and where the water table is. So in the very, uh, you know, so if we do a cross-section analysis, we look at the soil surface, bedrock, and water table depth. Uh, at the hilltop, if we've got a really steep hill and there's a lot of erosion going on uh, at, at the top and very little decomposition, well, we have a very thin soil surface. We hit the bedrock very quickly. When we go down, the soil depth is, is, is rather shallow. The water table is too deep for the plants to get there. So you really need those deep-rooted plants to get all the way down into the, reach enough water. And often, you know, it's the large particle size which drains rapidly as well. So the bedrock lacks adequate porosity and doesn't support the life that we really need up there. What about the, the, the hillside? Well, if it's a steep slope, it's challenging to work with. Uh, the, the bedrock may be close to the surface and the, and the water can run off rapidly and we can lose our soil, lose our nutrients, and lose the, the chances for the soil to, to work on it. Now, if we had a, a, a gradual slope side, that would be a very good place to do it. So if we have a, a, a gradual slope where we don't have the rapid runoff, we have uh, soil depth that's adequate, we have the water table that's closer to the surface, well then that can support life extremely well. What about at the base of a hill where, where we're at the water level, uh, at the water table level? Well, the soil may be deep, but the water table is right near the surface, and water limits root depth so the, because the plants need air access, they need the oxygen and the nitrogen. So many plants that need these uh, to get to the, to the plant uh, root zone aren't going to do well. And those are many of the crops that we consume. Some plants in the marginal swampy areas are doing lots of work to uh, biotransform uh, uh, unwanted uh, uh, components in the water and do it through bioremediation and they don't need they have different ways of getting the oxygen, like the reed plants, <laughs> the way that they're designed, they can get oxygen uh, to their plant roots via the, the, the core of the reed plant. But most plants that we're looking to consume and, and, uh, and plant for uh, production for ourselves, they actually need uh, the water to be able to drain from the roots so that they get enough air into the root zone. So, what about strategies? Approaches that we can use uh, depending on which climate zone we're in. Well, we can use cover crops, we can use hugel culture, we can use key line design, we can use swale systems, we can do composting, we can do mulching, we can do rotational grazing. All of these systems can be utilized in order to build soil. So with our dry land approach, uh, what options do, should we be uh, focusing on? So since it's the dry lands, we have very little precipitation. So it's best to utilize the lowest point in the landscape so we can optimize as much uh, moisture retention as possible for the plants that are there. Focus on water catchment areas. The temperate approach is a bit different. So we have, typically we have optimal climate for annual crops. 
And uh, you know, that's why industrial agriculture does so well in a temperate uh, climate zone. However, where I live, because we have the, uh, we're up in the uh, snow belt and high rain area during the winter months, and we have relatively dry summers, well, what we want to do is build permanent raised beds so that the beds aren't too wet for too long during the springtime, and they dry out a little bit quicker as a result of them being uh, raised, and therefore we have better crop production. We can get our crops in earlier in the season. What about the tropical approach? Well, they have poor uh, soil nutrient retention. Uh, the nutrient cycling occurs rapidly at, at the soil surface or in the plant material that's there. So it's best to use perennial crops in tropical areas. Okay, let's talk about nutrient cycling versus nutrient mining. First, we'll discuss the current, the way that we're, we're dealing with our nutrient sources, our nutrient pools today, and that's nutrient mining. So in nutrient mining, we extract the nutrients from the, from the soil pool or the nutrient pool. We grow plants. We feed animals and people. Waste is disposed of in landfills. It's incinerated. We have sewage treatment systems. Some of the materials end up in, in runoff. Some of it ends up in our, in, as pollution, non-point uh, sources of pollution. So our nutrient pools are being depleted and we're creating uh, all sorts of uh, problems, including pollution and climate change. This depletion of the nutrient pools can't support further population growth in the future. Now let's talk about a different way of doing things, the permaculture way, nutrient cycling. So from the soil, our nutrient pool, we go ahead and we feed the plants through, through microorganisms and those plants can feed the animals, including us. And then our waste products can, and, and our dead animals and dead plants can be broken down through composting the, via the microbes in, in the soil, in decom, uh, decomposition, or we can do active composting piles. We can do mulching. We can use living machines, like, such as John Todd's living machines, doing bioremediation, phytoremediation, and, and, and uh, mycel remediation using fun, fungi to break down the materials that we've produced. And therefore, the, all of the nutrients are returned back to the soil pool, the nutrient pool, there, thereby producing no waste, no pollution, reducing man-made climate change, and we're recharging our nutrient pools. Seems like a better way to go about things. So that's the end of our first discussion on uh, soil. Hopefully there'll be a, a couple other topics and we'll go into the various ways that we're making soil on site as well. So if you have any questions or concerns, please leave a comment down below. Please give it a thumbs up if you think this, this was a value to you and please share with your friends if you will. Thank you very much for watching and have a great day. Bye bye folks.